we start with the first event of the so-called Papillon seminars. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. okay. Yes. So, so uh, I will uh, have a five-minute introduction, and thereafter we follow with our today program. So welcome everybody to the first event of the Papillon seminars uh, for the faculty. I share my window. Okay. Can you see my shared? Yes, Tamas. Yes. Okay. So uh, here I presented the uh, members of the faculty and our uh, excellent speakers. Honestly speaking, this series of webinars serves partly to maintain the interest of colleagues who participated in the previous US CITO meetings or in the two Papillon courses and to recruit colleagues to a video-based postgraduate learning process. If we would have a goal with these events that have been going on for a couple of years, the most important thing is to be able to, re to reduce the differences uh, in the interpretation of individual ultrasound features. We try to get new impulses from the speakers, including some excellent new internationally renewed experts of thyroid ultrasound and the participants while preparing to the next nine month course, which will start in next September. Uh, 259 colleagues from 48 countries and from all continents have applied to the Papillon seminars, including 117 who are the first time with us. While around 80% of the around 200 participants of the previous two Papillon courses have joined again. For the sake of the latter, I promise that we do not reuse reviews, lectures, fresh presentations and new case studies were and will be prepared for the seminars. Some thoughts about the program. Here you can see uh, the topics of the five events. We will meet us at the third Thursday of every second month from today till May 2024. Usually we start with two 20-minute lectures followed by a discussion and thereafter usually six cases will be discussed jointly. <laughs> Based on the previous experiences, we usually exceed the planned time frame of 90 minutes. If someone gets tired of it, can watch what she or he missed from the Sunday evening after the event. All presenters have agreed to record the webinars and their lectures. The recording of an entire event will be presented three days after the webinar on the website where it was announced. For example, of the today event here, I lost myself. <laughs> so small because I have to record the event. So Okay, so here is the first event where it will, uh, was announced, and here will be present the recording uh, from Sunday. Uh, the recording of an entire event uh, serves the goal of repetition and provides the opportunity to watch the lectures and discussion of cases for those who, for any reason, could not be participated in the live event. The recordings will be available till the end of June 2024. Regarding the scientific content, uh, as I mentioned, okay. usually we will have two or one lectures. On the two-day meeting, we try to give a comprehensive knowledge about the evaluation of nodular goiter patients and the use of suspicious ultrasound uh, findings. On the next event on November, the microclassification as a specific feature will be discussed. In contrast with the first two webinars, which indeed is about the papillary cancer, in January, here, we will discuss uh, the ultrasound presentation of non-papillary thyroid cancers and the postoperative ultrasound of thyroid malignancies. In March, 
we emerge into the details of cytological and histopathological uh, differential diagnostics. On the last uh, event in May, uh, the ultrasound guided procedures, uh, first of all, thermal ablation technique will be in the focus. After the lectures, as for example today, here we will discuss cases. Uh, today, maybe we will discuss nine cases, but usually we will discuss six one. These case studies will be presented in advance on the website. It is worth to view these videos in advance, and I will be thankful uh, if you answer the related questionnaire, which is always below the case studies. A few words about technical uh, details. At the start, I will mute everybody. So you must unmute yourself if you want to ask or to add to the topic. Those who have problems with their microphone can ask in chat. In our previous courses, the participants were very grateful that we answered or at least tried to answer all questions. If you will be very active, it is possible that we will not be able to answer all questions at the live event. At the same time, we will provide answers to unanswered questions in the website, or you can ask me by email. Finally, I raise your attention to the related learning materials. Here you can find some pre-recorded lectures. It serves to upgrade the knowledge of those who have limited experience in thyroid ultrasound because the course is dedicated for advanced uh, uh, colleagues. So, turn to the today event. I guess that neither of our speakers requires introduction. They are leading experts in the thyroid gland and particularly in thyroid ultrasound. We are talking about the two uh, first authors of the two most basic publications on the subject on the EU thyroids and the new guideline on thyroid modules. I greet today's speakers Cosimo Durant and, uh, Durante and Gilles Rus with great friendship and respect. Please, Cosimo, add your presentation. Thank you, Tamás. Thank you for your uh, introduction. I'm going to share my desktop and showing you my slides. So, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, we, we can see, but sorry, Cosimo, first I unmute everybody, including you, because we are 70 here and uh, many are not muted. So I mute everybody, yes. And let's uh, try unmute yourself, Cosimo. Okay. Okay, I can hear you, it's excellent. Okay, so as you can see, the title of my presentation is uh, What's New in the New ETA Guideline? Uh, before going through this subject, uh, I would like to start with two uh, premises. The first one, I have no conflict of interest related to this subject. The second, uh, I'm uh, speaking today on behalf of uh, a panel of uh, expert people. And I'm really happy to say that uh, today we have uh, two of these uh, members here. I'm speaking of uh, Tamash and Gilles Rius. Uh, here you can see the uh, different disciplines of their panel. We had uh, endocrinologists, uh, radiologists, uh, endocrine surgery, surgeon, uh, pathologists, and also a biologist, and you will understand why we involve the pathologist presentation. But why the European Thyroid Association committed a guideline on thyroid nodule? Well, the first reason is because we need for more cost-effective risk-adapted approaches to the management of a thyroid nodule, because this is a highly prevalent condition. This is one of the studies showing that uh, we had an increase uh, in the incidence and as a consequence also in the prevalence of thyroid nodules uh, across uh, the world. 
These are the figures coming from European countries. You can see that in uh, almost all countries, there was uh, an increase uh, over time uh, in the incidence, uh, especially involving the middle age uh, uh, people, as you can see from this uh, graph. So a high prevalent condition requiring a cost-effective approach. Second, because uh, uh, so far uh, we had uh, only guidelines coming from uh, 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 US, we had the American Inter-Association guidelines or even the ACE uh, guidelines, but there are uh, some uh, peculiarity in our continent and so it's uh, useful uh, to have uh, a strategy adapted to the European framework. Uh, what are the goals uh, and the aims of these uh, guidelines? First of all, to provide uh, a clinical practice guide for the initial workup and the subsequent management of uh, adult individuals, arboreal internal nodules. So, adult, these uh, guidelines are age and are not intended also to cover the management of uh, thyroid malignancy. So the focus is on thyroid nodules. We have other guidelines uh, uh, promoted by the European Thyroid Association dealing specifically with the issue of the thyroid malignancy. And finally, I have to acknowledge that uh, in this uh, uh, guideline, uh, the, uh, we refer to other previously published guidelines dealing with thyroid nodules, specifically with the guideline on the eutyrats, and the two guidelines uh, on the uh, minimally invasive approaches to thyroid nodules, to benign thyroid nodules and malignant thyroid nodules. So uh, we endorse uh, these uh, guidelines that they have been incorporated and uh, uh, in some way updated. In so these are the chapters, the contents that you can find into the uh, new guideline. Uh, we have a, a chapter for the initial evaluation of thyroid nodule, a chapter for uh, focusing on thyroid ultrasound, thyroid biopsy, pathology, Molecular diagnostics, this is the reason why we involved also Paula Soares as a biologist in our team. Uh, Non-ultrasound imaging modalities, uh, therapeutic options, uh, uh, both non-surgical and surgical approaches. And uh, on the wall, uh, we uh, deliver uh, 35 recommendations uh, across uh, all these uh, uh, subjects. I have not all these sections. So my goal today is uh, highlighting uh, some uh, most relevant uh, aspects uh, coming from these guidelines. Uh, in this regard, I decided to present uh, three parallel histories of patients uh, in order to go into, the, uh, into some recommendation of the new guidelines. Uh, here we have uh, a young lady with this uh, solid high thyroid nodule with uh, regular margins. Uh, you can see here the sites. Uh, here we have a nodule uh, which is uh, solid, uh, heterogeneous in terms of texture. And you can see there is some hyperechoic and some high thyroid area compared to the surrounding tissue. And finally, there is uh, this uh, tiny nodule. This is a hyperechoic nodule uh, with uh, irregular borders and the nodule is the uh, largest diameter, so 7.2. All these patients were eutyroid. So, if uh, we have to follow the algorithm uh, designed and uh, promoted by these guidelines, uh, the first step when we are faced to patient like the three that I'm presenting, uh, the first step is uh, performing the neck ultrasound and uh, classifying the nodule according to the sonographic uh, and uh, as you can see here, we have uh, uh, four classes, eutyroid 2, 3, 4, and 5, with different risk of malignancies. Uh, we have uh, very low risk nodules, less than 1, 2.4%, intermediate risk, and high risk nodule, with a risk of malignancy greater than 20%. So if uh, we uh, look at our patients, uh, the three patients I presented, 
they fall into these uh, three categories, which are as three, four, and five. Two, I remember, are anechoic or entirely spongiform nodules, which are virtually benign. Then we have the low risk nodule, uh, uh, entirely isoechoic or high epirechoic, like uh, the nodule of our patient. We have uh, uh, uterus 4 nodule with a hypoechoic, even partly hypoechoic nodule. I would like to say mildly hypoechoic, so not darker than the strap muscles. And uh, this nodule fall in this uh, category because we have a uh, a portion of the nodule which is hypoechoic as compared to the uh, surrounding uh, parenchyma. And finally, we have uh, highly suspicious nodules. And this nodule, this uh, small nodule, is a highly suspicious nodule because uh, it is uh, hypoechoic with irregular borders. So let's have a look at the recommendation uh, based on the initial risk stratification. Uh, in case of uh, uterus 2 nodules, uh, we have only one option, surveillance, so no finite respiration. While in case of uterus 3 nodules, uh, where the risk is, uh, of malignancy is uh, between 2 to 4%, uh, in case of nodule uh, smaller than 20 millimeter, this node has to be addressed to surveillance, greater than 20 millimeter finite respiration. In these boxes, I would like to highlight uh, two uh, points. First, the panel stated that uh, if you have uh, uterus 2 and uterus 3 nodule uh, lower than one centimeter, these nodules uh, do not require any further evaluation. In other words, we may stop the follow-up. If we have nodule greater than one centimeter, in this case, uh, this nodule uh, can be followed over time. But as you can see here, the interval or follow-up are between three to five years. Why lengthening the follow-up and reaching this uh, uh, cutoff for three to five years? There are several reasons to apply this uh, uh, strategy. First of all, we know from the data of the literature that the growth of the uh, sonographically benign nodule is slow. This is a one. Uh, experience from Italy. This is a multicenter study exploring the natural history of a benign nodule, including a cytologically benign or let's say sonographically benign nodule. Only a group of nodules had experienced the growth, about around 16%. But most important for our uh, recommendation, those nodules experiencing a growth and a, a slight growth over time. Here you can see the mean changes in the larger diameters. The mean change was uh, over five years, 4.9 millimeter. You can see also the 95 confidence interval are really, really sweet between 4 to 5.5. So this may say that uh, on, on average, a sonographically benign nodule has a growth to, of uh, one millimeter per year, so a slow growth. To, and this uh, allows us uh, to increase uh, the interval of follow-up. Second, uh, only a subgroup of uh, have an increase uh, in the ultrasound risk uh, category. Uh, here you can see from the study that uh, the rate of nodule having an increase over a five year uh, period of the uh, risk, sonographic risk of malignancy. With, uh, by applying all the uh, trials, all the risk stratification systems, the nodule experiencing an increase of the risk ranges between 14% to 30%. But most important, only a set group of this nodule at the end after five years, become eligible to finite respiration. And the range was between six to 7%. So if we have at the baseline, a patient with a sonographically benign nodule, the risk to have uh, uh, an increase in the risk of malignancy estimated to ultrasound over five years is between six to 7%. And this support a recommendation to lengthening 
the interval of the follow-up and to increase uh, the interval to follow-up to up to three to five years. Finally, and this is another uh, important uh, issue, the risk of, of overlooking malignancy over five years uh, is really rare. Again, I come back to the study, the uh, prospective study I showed you before. In this study, we had uh, a group of uh, patients undergoing fine respiration at baseline and after five years. And as you can see, the risk of missing malignancy was around 1% in this series of patients. And this means that uh, once that we have classified a nodule as uh, the risk of uh, uh, be, to be phased to a cancer is really uh, low. Uh, there is another aspect that I would like to stress looking at these uh, uh, boxes. Uh, significant growth. What does it mean, significant growth? This is the definition we apply for significant growth. An increase, an increase of uh, greater than 20% in at least two nodules diameters. This means that uh, this definition uh, corresponds to an increase in the volume uh, greater than 50%. This definition is for, for sure a definition uh, which is uh, reproducible in the clinical practice. So decrease uh, the inter-observer variability. Uh, we don't know if this is a clinically significant uh, uh, definition of growth. We, we, uh, today we don't have uh, uh, evidence in this regard. Uh, we need also to correct uh, this definition of significant growth uh, with the time of growth, uh, the time to growth, the rate of growth. But so far we have no uh, definition uh, validated by these uh, studies. What about the nodules falling the uterus 4 and uterus 5? In this case, uh, I would like to stress, as, a, uh, as a, I would like to remark, that if we have uh, uterus 5 nodules lower than 1 centimeter, these nodules may be addressed to uh, active surveillance, especially in, in particular if uh, we do not see suspicious lymph nodes, uh, in the absence of risk of extratrial extension, or if the nodule is uh, far from the uh, trachea or laryngeal nerve area. And this uh, uh, recommendation comes from the series of uh, studies addressing the issue of the active surveillance, showing that only a minority of nodules experience a, a, a growth over time. I'm referring to nodule with a, a cytological diagnosis of a thyroid cancer and these nodules may have a, a, the appearance of a lymph node metastasis uh, over a mean follow-up of uh, four years so uh, supporting the idea of uh, an active surveillance program coming back to our patients uh, at the end we have uh, these patients having a uterus three four and five uh, nodule uh, so no indication according to the sites to the risk of sonographic risk of uh, uh, finite aspiration for the first and the third case, uh, while the second case, uh, uh, in the second case, the finite aspiration is indicated according to the algorithm I showed before. So for the first, the third patient, by applying the algorithm, after this initial evaluation, I may suggest to this lady, to this uh, man, to repeat ultrasound in three to five years here and every six to 12 months here because uh, these suspicious nodules is uh, far from the trachea, is far from the uh, margins of the thyroid gland, so no risk of exotary extensions uh, in the absence, of course, of uh, lymph node metastasis. What about the follow-up of these patients requiring finite aspiration? Well, if uh, we uh, perform finite aspiration and we have uh, a Bethesda 1, in this case, the suggestion is to repeat finite aspiration. And if the finite aspiration is again not diagnostic, we may consider corneal biopsy. If we have a Bethesda class 2, if in case of uterus 3 and 4, we may uh, lengthen the follow up to 3 to 5 years, while in case of uterus 5 nodules, in this case, there is a discordance between the cytology. The suggestion is uh, to repeat uh, the finite aspiration. If we have uh, 
indeterminate nodules, Bethesda 3 and 4, the suggestion is to consider for this patient surveillance, surgery, or molecular testing. So the molecular testing is a novelty, even if the panel knowledge that the, uh, these uh, tests are not available uh, in all countries. In most of the cases, they are available in a research setting. They are uh, costly. There is a lack of independent validation studies, a lack of long-term outcome studies. So uh, there is some caution in uh, uh, recommending the molecular tests, but still they may be an option uh, in the sites where the tests are available. Uh, finally, if we have Bethesda 5 and 6 nodules, in these cases, uh, the suggestion is to perform surgery. And uh, we also contemplated the scenario of patients uh, having a Bethesda 5 and 6 uh, at the lower cutoff sites as compared to the one reported here. In the clinical practice, we may, we may have also small nodules undergoing for aspiration. And even in, if this is not recommended by these guidelines, but if you are faced to a patient with a uterus, three, four, and five nodule uh, lower than one centimeter, in this case, uh, the panel uh, uh, take into consideration for this patient also the surveillance and the minimal invasive, uh, the use of the minimal invasive techniques. So coming back to my, uh, my patient, in this patient, uh, this patient, this is a true history, had uh, the cytology. The cytology was uh, Bethesda class 2, so the risk of malignancy faced with this cytology is uh, uh, up to 3%. And so, again, for this patient, uh, following the algorithm, we suggested, we will suggest, uh, if we apply these guidelines, uh, to repeat ultrasound in 3 to 5 years. These are my final remarks because before leaving the uh, uh, scenario to all the participants uh, and uh, to receive a question for the participants. Uh, these uh, uh, guidelines have been performed by applying the grade uh, approach. So we search for the best available research evidence, but uh, we also use uh, the knowledge and experience of the panelists, uh, especially where the evidence and uh, in order to reach a consensus uh, uh, among us, uh, we applied the modified Delphi process. So we had uh, two rounds of uh, online voting, uh, rating uh, all the recommendation uh, with a five-point scale. And we uh, considered uh, the consensus uh, if uh, uh, a, a greater percentage of uh, the panelists, greater than 80%, uh, voted uh, strongly agree, agree or neutral to the statement. So let me thank again uh, all the people participating to these uh, guidelines, uh, of course, uh, the ETA Executive Committee, the Guidelines Board. I uh, focus only on uh, specific uh, issues, uh, but the, most, the more controversial issue of the guidelines. Uh, and if you want, I'm ready to ask to your uh, question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cosimo, for this excellent uh, summary of the guideline. And the discussion is open. If someone has problems with uh, her or his microphone, can ask in chat. I have a very practical uh, question for the sake of beginners. Where is the region of uh, the nervous recurrent? Nobody is asked into this uh, too much question. No, uh, please, Cosimo, I, I ask you to, to, to clarify where is the region because uh, it is important in small nodules uh, to perform, not to perform. So yeah. for the sake of beginners, uh, where they... Uh... Absolutely. So uh, this is important because uh, in the guidelines, uh, we are stating that uh, for high-risk nodules, uh, lower than one centimeter, 
it's uh, an option to consider the active surveillance. And as I said, we need to avoid uh, to suggest active surveillance in patients uh, having suspicious lymph nodes, uh, so having extra extension and being close to the, uh, the uh, nerve area. And this means uh, in the, the corner between the trachea and the esophagus uh, on the uh, left side uh, and on the right side uh, and on the posterior borders of the thyroid gland uh, close to the trachea. trachea. These are a portion uh, where the, uh, laryn the laryngeal nerve is expected to be present. Uh, and so if the nodule is uh, uh, close to this area, actually surveillance is not recommended. Thank you very much. We have two questions as I see. Recommendation about u 5 Bethesda 3 and what means minimal invasive therapy? Okay, if, uh, if we have a Bethesda class uh, 3, we have in the indeterminate and the panel stated that the face to this nodule, we have uh, theoretically three options. The first option is the active su the, the surveillance. And of course, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this may be an option, but uh, uh, as for the Utrias 5 nodules, this is lower than one centimeter nodule. If I have a Utrias 5 nodule, but as a class three greater than uh, one centimeter, this is not an option. The other options, so, so it's uh, surgery, but the third option, if you have the uh, molecular testing, you may also perform a molecular testing. Uh, in the guidelines, we refer to large panel exploring uh, uh, almost uh, all the key uh, oncogenes, uh, driver oncogenes, uh, uh, so not the small panel with uh, only a few genes. Uh, because uh, uh, to consider a nodule uh, for a surveillance uh, following a molecular testing, uh, we need to have uh, uh, the nodule testing negative for all the key oncogenic drivers. Uh, there is another a question, what means minimal invasive therapy? This is a, a good uh, question because I didn't, uh, I didn't have time to go in, into this uh, subject. Um, there are... Uh, uh, a series of uh, minimal invasive uh, techniques. They are the, all the techniques uh, applying the thermal ablations uh, of the nodules. We may uh, uh, by performing a thermal ablation. Thermal by using uh, laser, radio frequency, uh, microwave, uh, uh, so these are all techniques uh, that are, are able to destroy the, destroy the nodules. Uh, and if you are faced to a specific uh, group of uh, the nodules, uh, uh, you may also, as an alternative to surgery, consider minimal invasive techniques. Is it important to use a scintigraphy before biopsy to close out uh, nodules? Uh, in, these, uh, in these guidelines, uh, we, uh, our consensus was uh, to uh, rely on the uh, TSH result. Even if, uh, so if the TSH is normal, we skip the scintigraphy and we move uh, to biopsy. Even if the panel acknowledged that uh, in some area, especially in an uh, area with uh, uh, low uh, iron, uh, with uh, iron deficiency, we may also, in patients with multinodular goiter, we may also have uh, patients with uh, uh, normal TSH having uh, functional nodules. So uh, the scintigraphy may be used in some specific region where the incidence of uh, uh, tired nodules, uh, autonomy, uh, low iodine, uh, I don't see other questions. Okay. So, other questions? If not, thank you very much, Cosimo, for this nice presentation.
You're welcome. Uh, if you uh, uh, can be with us uh, for the discussion of cases. Uh, Absolutely. So uh, now I ask uh, Gilles Rus uh, to add his presentation. Hi, Tamas. Uh, thank you. Um, I will share my screen. Okay, can you hear me and see the presentation? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, hi everyone, thank you for attending this course and thanks to Thomas also for inviting me. So, the topic of this lecture is uh, suspicious ultrasound characteristics of thyroid nodules. So, um, one thing I want to stress is that in the 2023 ETA guidelines, uh, Cosimo Durante has been addressing, uh, we have issued uh, in it uh, a new ultrasound lexicon that's different uh, from the one we issued in the 2017 ETA guidelines. So I advise you to upload the, the guidelines and to uh, upload the supplemental material. Uh, in this, uh, during this lecture, I will be uh, referring to the new lexicon. Uh, next, as uh, Cosimo uh, stated, the risk stratification system is still the one that we uh, released in 2017 with the previous guidelines. So these are the guidelines in 2017. Of course, you can upload them also freely. So let us start. I will go, I will first um, give you an overview uh, as uh, how the uh, main uh, risk stratification systems uh, try to um, diagnose uh, um, ultrasound with ultrasound uh, suspicious nodules. So regarding the eu Tarat score, I will go briefly uh, with it because uh, Cosimo Geronti also already showed you uh, the, the main points. But uh, as you show, as you see here, there are four features of high suspicion, taller than white shape, irregular margins, microcalcifications, and marked hypocogenicity. As Cosimo showed you, at least one feature is sufficient to consider a nodule with as at high risk of malignancy. And if you have no feature of high suspicion, the uh, EU tyrads risk stratification system is only dependent on the ecogenicity of the solid part of a nodule, mildly hypoechoic intermediate risk eu tyrat 4 isoechoic or hyperechoic low risk eu tyrat 3 and anechoic or entirely spongy form eu tyrat 2 Now, if we go uh, back to the 2015 ATA guidelines, there are things that uh, really are interesting. First of all, um, you can see here that high suspicion nodules, but also intermediate suspicion nodules, always are solid and hypoechoic. That is to say that these guidelines take into account the composition in the nodule and only retain as suspicious nodules that are solid and hypoechoic. Below this, we're in low suspicion. So that's a very interesting uh, statement. Second, if we go through the American College of Radiology tirades, you see here that the first thing to consider there again is composition. That is to say, if a nodule is cystic almost completely cystic or spongy form, it is ATR, ACR tyrads 1, then no FNA follow-up is advised. If it is of mixed cystic and solid composition or of solid or almost completely solid composition, then in that case, the points that will be attributed 
to the nodule won't be the same. That is to say that composition affects the risk of malignancy, but second, the ecogenicity will be different afterwards. So here, if you have a mixed cystic and solid nodule, which is hypoechoic, it will be rated three points. And if, the, if it is almost completely solid, if it will get four points. And then you will be adding other points according to other US features, like taller than wide, three points, definite extra thyroidal extension, three points also, but also macro calcifications, one point. And once you have summed the points here, you will be able to uh, go to obtain the ACR final thyroid score and to determine if um, fine needle aspiration is indicated or not, or if follow-up is indicated or not. Next, the Korean thyroid that was released in 2021, you see there again that the notion of solid and hypoechoic immediately places a nodule either in the high suspicion category or in the intermediate suspicion category, depending on the presence or absence of other uh, suspicious US features. And on the contrary, if it is partially cystic or isohyperechoic, then um, it, it will be rated at intermediate suspicion only if there are features of high suspicion and as low suspicion if there, are, if there aren't any. That is to say that there again, the ecogenicity and the composition of a nodule is taken into, are taken into account. So now, after this overview of uh, the different main uh, risk stratification systems, I will show you how to use uh, the features individually. So here, there again, I will be referring to the new lexicon that was published in 2023 in the ETA guidelines on thyroid nodules. So first, composition. Composition is the proportion of soft tissue or fluid. So here, the uh, feature of high suspicion, of suspicion at, at least, is solid. And solid, the definition of it that you have to remember is composed almost entirely of soft tissue with less than 10% of liquid. So that would be the feature of a suspicious, a suspicious nodule. So if you take those examples on the top of the uh, slide, you have nodules with mixed composition. That is to say nodules which are both solid and with cystic cavities. On the right, rather large cystic cavities, and on the left, small cystic cavities, but in less than 50% of the nodule surface, that is to say that the left nodule, although being of mixed composition, is not a spongy form nodule. On the bottom of the slide, on the, at the opposite, the two nodules that I'm showing you are solid, entirely solid nodules. So these one, you must be aware that they are more at risk than the one at the top. Now, what about the ecogenicity? Uh, first of all, ecogenicity always refers to the solid part of a nodule, not to the uh, cystic part. Uh, one very in informative and important thing in the new lexicon is that the reference tissue can be the normal healthy thyroid, but in case uh, the uh, thyroid tissue is not of normal ecogenicity, you can also refer and always ecogenicity of the muscle fibers with low adipose tissue. So this can you help this can help you differentiate minimally moderately hypoic nodules from markedly hypoic refer to the muscle fibers, but not to the adipose tissue in it. Uh, 
So the features of suspicion, of course, here will be hypoechogenicity, which can be mildly hypoechoic or markedly hypoechoic. So mildly hypoechoic is darker than the healthy thyroid tissue, but less dark than the muscle fibers with low adipose tissue content. On the other hand, markedly hypoechoic nodules will be similarly dark, this is new too, or darker than the muscle fibers with low adipose tissue content. So these nodules are all at intermediate risk because they have some hypoechogenicity in their solid part. Uh, top left uh, picture, this is an entirely solid nodule which is mildly hypoechoic. On the top uh, right, you have a mixed composition nodule, but the solid part is also mildly hypoechoic. And at the bottom of the slide, you see this nodule, which is mainly isoechoic, but it sufficient part to be classified as EU tyrats for an intermediate risk. I will go back to this notion a little later. Now let us come to marked hypoechogenicity. You see that these two nodules are more hypoechoic than uh, the uh, surrounding strap muscles, even if you take uh, the uh, really uh, fibrous part of it, the muscular part of it, and not the adipose content. So this is uh, an example of marked hypoechogenicity, of course, movies, videos don't always work, even if I tested them uh, an hour ago. So I will show you uh, the same nodule with fixed images on the right part of the screen, and you can see the ecogenicity of a nodule being more hypoechoic than here, the uh, muscle. Another example, if the video is ready to operate, yes. So you have this nodule with oval regular shape and parallel orientation to the skin with regular margins, solid exclusively, moderately hypoechoic compared to the strap muscles and to the normal thyroid parenchyma, very good, Tyrats 4. So let us come now to ecotexture. Ecotexture characterizes the uniform or multiform uh, aspect of the solid portion of a nodule. That is to say that uh, we have nodules that are heterogeneous. Heterogeneous means that they are both isoechoic and hypoechoic regarding their solid portions. So here we have made uh, a new definition of what is um, significant uh, for a nodule that is heterogeneous to be considered as hypoechoic, and it is as having at least a five millimeter hypoechoic solid portion. In that case, you will consider that this portion is significant and you will classify it as EU Tyrats 4. The preferred naming could be dominantly hypoechoic or dominantly isoechoic. So this is an example of a uh, heterogeneous nodule. You see that there is a hypoechoic part at the anterior aspect of a nodule, but mainly it is isoechoic here. But the hypoechoic part is sufficient to classify the nodule in the as EU Tyrats 4, as it is more than five millimeters. Now margin. Margins refer to the outline of a single uh, true nodule. So the uh, suspect uh, feature is of course irregular margin. So these irregular margins are divided into two subgroups speculated margins, which mean one or more sharp angle, and lobulated, microlobulated margins, which are one or more round protrusions. 
And we have to add to this that the surface irregularity is not caused by other conditions. Some, some, sometimes there can be compression by a neighboring nodule or by the intrinsic anatomy of a patient. And the irregularities are not due to the nodule by itself. And moreover, to uh, consider that these uh, speculations or lobulations are significant, they should protrude by two millimeters from the surface of a nodule. So these are irregular margins at the top speculations, like the one you can see on the two nodules I'm showing you, and at the bottom, lobulations, which are uh, small rounded protrusions. This is another example with the video. I'm showing you small rounded protrusions. These are lobulations and these are suspicious. Another example with a fixed image. On, for this nodule, you have both speculations and lobulations. Another example of speculations. You see that they protrude more than two millimeters from the rest of the surface of the nodule. And this is the fixed image in case uh, the video wouldn't have uh, functioned. Now let us come to the halo. The halo uh, here when it is thin and complete is in favor of a follicular adenoma but can sometimes be found in low-grade uh, classical variant of papillary carcinoma. When the halo is absent, it can be found on the contrary in a papillary carcinoma. And if the halo on the right part of the screen is thick, uh, this is sometimes found in the follicular variant of papillary carcinoma, or in follicular carcinomas. Shape. So shape, uh, we now refers to the direction of growth and the uh, feature that is suspicious is the, is the non-parallel orientations. So it can be either taller than wide or taller than long, but some authors advocate the use of a 1.2 ratio as a cutoff value to increase specificity. That is to say that the thickness would have to be at least 12 millimeters if the width of a nodule is 10 millimeters to be considered as relevant and significant. And moreover, a very important thing is that this non-parallel orientation cannot be explained by anatomical situation or the presence of a distorting effect of a neighboring nodule. That is to say that, for instance, at the lower pole of the thyroid gland, very often a nodule does not have a parallel orientation because it is compressed between the carotid artery and the trachea. So these are examples of non-parallel orientation. You see on the left uh, part of the slide, a nodule that is thicker, that is to say taller than it is long, and thicker, that is to say taller than it is wide. Same thing for the right nodule. So taller refers to the thickness of a nodule. Another example here, of a nodule that is taller than it is long and taller than it is wide. Um, so already told you of this 1.2 ratio. You can refer to the excellent report by uh, Granny and colleagues in the ETJ in 2020. And another very interesting report in European radiology, uh, which uh, showed 
the evidence that a taller than wide feature is equivalent to a taller than long uh, appearance regarding the risk of malignancy. And finally, still uh, talking about the shape, uh, this very interesting report recently issued uh, by Giorgio Grani and colleagues and Cosimo Durante uh, that showed us that a shape by itself is not an independent predictor of malignancy. That is to say that when you encounter a nodule that is taller than wide, but is isoechoic with regular margins, very probably it's going to be benign. And one other very interesting uh, thing that uh, this report came up with is that the number of features of suspicion uh, increases uh, the risk of malignancy. That is to say, the higher the number the higher the risk of malignancy. So if you take all the features that I have showed you, shown you, sorry, and that there are at least three features, the risk of malignancy will be really higher than the, when there is only one feature of malignancy. So in this example, this nodule is taller than wide. It has irregular margins, it has multiple hyperechoic foci. So here, of course, very probably we're, de we're dealing with cancer. Intranodular hyperechoic figures, I will go through this briefly because you have an entire lecture on this uh, subject later on during the course, but microcalcifications were defined as a bright high ecogenic foci measuring no more than one millimeter, most often round and very importantly located in the solid part of the nodule. Sometimes when the cystic content is desiccated, it can be difficult to distinguish between true microcalcification from uh, back wall figures that correspond to uh, microcystic uh, cavities, and it's not always possible. Macrocalcifications on the other end uh, measure more than one millimeter and they are, are also defined by the presence of an acoustic shadow. So uh, one should distinguish between central macrocalcifications, which are very often encountered in benign nodules, where our peripheral macrocalcifications are uh, more uh, related to malignancy. So here I'm showing you an example of true microcalcifications. You see very numerous hyperechoic small foci, round ones, located in the solid part of a nodule. So this is a video again. I'm very, I'm so sorry, it's not working, but you can see anyway the hyperechoic foci that are numerous and located in the solid part of a nodule. And you could also, referring to the two reports at the bottom of the slide, consider that the distribution of hyperechoic foci is very important. That is to say that peripheral distribution is more suspect than a homogeneous distribution. This nodule on the left is PTC and on the right is a benign adenomatous nodule. An example of peripheral distribution that uh, you should take with caution. It's the same nodule, but you see the peripheral distribution of the hyperechoic foci, especially at the bottom left of the slide, and this is PTC. So let us come to macrocalcifications. On the uh, left of the slide, this continuous complete macrocalcification is most often benign, but still in four to five percent will correspond to a carcinoma. It is considered at low risk. At the uh, middle part of the slide, these discontinuous in uh, macrocalcifications at the border of the nodules are at intermediate risk, 27 percent. And if you have this interrupted macrocalcification on the right 
part of the slide with a protrusion of soft tissue outside the nodule, then it is at high risk and you should FNA this very short, small, sorry, portion to get the uh, malignant cell. Let us come to extrathyroidal extensions. So a uh, minor extrathyroidal extension can be considered if the thyroid pseudocapsule is discontinuous or not visible and gross extrathyroidal extension if the nodule extends inside the uh, muscles. In case there is no capsular con contact with the nodule, and view with a thyroid capsule, extra thyroidal extension can be reliably excluded. You can refer yourself to the very good report by uh, Martina and colleagues in 2021 regarding this subject. So here on the left part of the slide, no capsular contact, no extra thyroidal extension. Right part of the slide, capsular bulging. This is of feeble value. At the uh, left part of the slide here, you see the thyroid capsule is interrupted, discontinuous. This is in favor of extra minor extrafidal extension. But I will stress the fact that on the right part of the slide, it is much more difficult to see when the nodule abuts the posterior thyroid capsule. Here, macro, uh, like Thomas would say, gross extrafidal extension. In France, we say macroscopic. Um, well, um, here the, you can see the no, both nodules on the left and right part of the slide extends, extends sorry, in the strap muscle. So here you really have to tell the surgeon before the operation and you really have to perform the FNA uh, whatever the size of this nodule is. Last, of course, you will always assess cervical lymph nodes. This remains mandatory, but you can all only search for features of high suspicion, which are cystic cavities, thyroid-like tissue, microcalcifications, and anarchic vascularity. And you can refer yourself to the 2013 ETA guidelines on the subject. These are my conclusions. So refer to both 2017 and 2023 guidelines. Look for solid composition and hypoechogenicity. We are, these are the cornerstones to pick up suspicious nodules because they represent 85% of all thyroid carcinomas. And of course, we have other features of high suspicion, as I, saw, as I have shown you. Thank you for your attention. So I will stop uh, sharing my screen um, so that I can take with great pleasure your questions. Thank you for this excellent presentation and summary. And the discussion is open. Uh, I have an introductory, uh, I guess these were the previous uh, questions. So uh, uh, what is your explanation that all three American thyroid systems include coarse calcification into their thyroids, while neither European nor Korean guideline does? Um, regarding uh, the uh, ETA 2017 guidelines, I think that First, uh, by that time, uh, the evidence uh, was not that strong that these were important features. So evidence um, has grown since that time. So for this, uh, uh, this is part of the explanation. Second explanation is that we uh, had not the knowledge that we could be sure that uh, most often central macro calcifications were um, related to um, hemorrhagic and uh, intracystic um, modifications that went that go along with the fact that the nodules the nodule is old and that it is benign 
over time in its aspect, and that on the contrary, the peripheral macro calcifications were more suspect. Finally, I think that we, in 2017, we tried with Cosimo and all other co-authors to uh, come up with a really simple system and to introduce uh, as less as significant uh, features that was necessary to come up with a uh, nice risk stratification. But okay. of course, Cosimo could comment on this uh, very well, I think. You are muted, Cosimo, if you want to. Oh, please unmute, yes. Yes, sorry. Excuse me, Gilles, can you repeat your uh, question to me? Sorry. Oh, I, I, I just uh, uh, formulated that if you wanted to give your opinion on the subject, it would surely be very interesting uh, regarding macro calcifications. If you had something yeah. else to, to say, of course. No, actually, we have no uh, good evidence, even if uh, there are uh, several reports coming uh, out uh, on the subject. Uh, uh, pointing out that uh, macro course, course calcification may have some significance, uh, still, uh, personally, I'm not so convinced by this uh, evidence uh, because there are several confounding factors uh, when I read uh, these uh, papers. Uh, as you point out, as you point out uh, by quoting the manuscript from uh, Giorgio Grani, sometimes there is there are uh, an overlap mm -hmm. of uh, ultrasound suspicious findings. So it's uh, uh, we have no evidence that uh, these features independently predict a risk of malignancy. Probably uh, with other features, they may have some significance. So this is actually my, my idea on the subject. Okay. That's very interesting, very interesting comment. <laughs> We have two questions in the chat. Does hypothyroidism and uh, uh, elastography about elastography? I can answer to the first question because I think it's. Does hypothyroidism or mildly elevated antibody titer influence FNE result? Any studies on that matter? Yeah. Um... Well, I'm not a cytopathologist, obviously, but I can partly answer the question. Um, in case of uh, chronic uh, thyroiditis, uh, yes, it does influence the, uh, the cytologic uh, pattern. So this is uh, encompassed in the uh, new uh, 2023 Bethesda system anyway, but uh, you should uh, be aware that the uh, thyroiditis can modify uh, the aspect of the thyroid cells and make them uh, suspicious in a way uh, that they are not uh, truly. And so uh, this information should be given to the cytopathologist so that he or she takes it into account uh, when uh, Giving, making his report. Uh, probably, Thomas, you, you could comment this more nicely than me anyway. Yes, there are two problems with thyroiditis in the cytology. First, that uh, thyroiditis, uh, the thyroiditis can produce a very high level of atypia. Uh, but if we are aware about this uh, opportunity, this possibility, the other problem is that uh, the Hurta cell proliferation, the proliferation of oxyphilic cells might mimic Hurta cell tumor. So these two problems uh, cannot be uh, uh, neglected. Uh, so uh, it is quite uh, uh, evident that uh, the false positive rate in the event of thyroiditis is much higher than in the lack of thyroiditis. If I may stress uh, what uh, Tamas is stating, uh... Sometimes these uh, nodules are classified as a Bethesda class uh, four because of the the enriched oxyphilic cells, as uh, Thomas uh, said. So in this in this uh, regard, they, they may be uh, 
upgraded it from a benign cytology to an indeterminate cytology. We have a question about elastography. I wonder why elastography has not been included in the guidelines yet. Well, there, there is a vast debate <laughs> because uh, if you uh, look at the literature, there are many reports uh, that are in favor of the uh, good diagnostic value for elastography. Um, unfortunately, there are many problems also with elastography. Um, first problem is that <laughs> Uh, although we've been using it since uh, 2010, that's more than 10 years, uh, we have not been able to come up with um, ratios or uh, values, whether with shear wave or uh, mechanical uh, elastography, strain elastography, that we all agree with. So the, the cutoffs for between malignancy and benignity uh, moreover, um, the reproducibility of these values from one observer to another is not good. Third, uh, this uh, elastography is uh, of feeble value when you have macro calcifications, when the nodule is huge, when it has cystic composition. So, all these uh, are difficulties. Um, then, uh, when you practice elastography, you will realize that uh, when a nodule is of high stiffness, that is to say, of course, suspicious, most often it is already obvious with B mode, you will have other features of high suspicion. So it's only a kind of confirmation, but it was already EU TIRAS5 because when a nodule is of high stiffness, it most often corresponds to papillary thyroid carcinoma. The uh, follicular variant of PTC and the follicular carcinomas most of the time are soft nodules. That would be the ones that we will be very glad to be able to detect uh, more nicely, more efficiently. But uh, in, in, uh, unfortunately, elastography doesn't uh, work for this. But in some cases, if, my, if I may extend my answer a minute longer, when I have some doubt between a EU TIRATS 4 nodule and a EU TIRATS 5, because let's say the margins are slightly irregular, or the hypercogenicity is close to the one of the strap muscles. And if I turn on the elastography and the nodule is of high stiffness, even if it measures, let's say, 12 millimeters, and if it's EU TIRATS 4, of course, I'm not supposed to FNA it. I will perform probably the FNA because I will consider that this, the malignancy risk is close to the EU TIRATS 5 nodule. And sometimes I also use elastography to differentiate between a true or a pseudo, pseudo nodule in uh, chronic lymphocytic uh, thyroiditis. But for all these reasons, we couldn't make guidelines to uh, and uh, tell people to use it uh, daily because uh, there isn't sufficient evidence on the subject. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Yes, we have one more. Yep. So isn't it important to use scintigraphy before biopsy to close out hot, hot nodules? <laughs> That's it, it, a tricky one. It's a cute uh, uh, event uh, at the end of Cosimo's presentation. Yeah, do you want to answer that one, Cosimo? Because it's rather a, a general question regarding the yeah, guidelines. Absolutely. Uh, what I was saying before is that uh, as a general rule, if you have a normal TSH and a thyroid nodule, uh, you 
should avoid the scintigraphy. However, the panel discussed this issue because we know that we may have patients with thyroid nodule, normal TSH, but still uh, and hot nodule. Uh, this is not so common in most of the uh, geographical area. It's uh, uh, more with the iodine deficiency. So in these specific regions, uh, practitioners may consider to perform uh, scintigraphy. But as a general rule, uh, this is not a cost-effective approach outside the area with a low uh, iodine uh, up uptake, intake. Okay. Other questions before turning to the joint analysis of case studies? Okay, if not, uh, I have a question to Gilles. Uh, would you present your three cases? Uh, you can you share? Sure, sure. I can. I okay, can so do we will of course. start with uh, three cases of Gilles, Rust, uh, and thereafter uh, with other which will presented in the website. So please, Gilles. Okay, so you suggest, Thomas, we go through one uh, case and then discuss and sequentially, I, I suppose. Yes. Yes. Okay. Of course. So we'll close the former presentation. I will turn on the clinical cases. Okay, uh, so we, uh, today we have three clinical cases. Of course, the topic of, it, of these are uh, suspicious US features. So um, what I would like uh, the attendees to do is um, try to identify the uh, suspicious features of each nodule, then maybe ask themselves if um, they would perform or not the FNA, and maybe uh, what treatment in some of the three cases they would uh, suggest or propose. So let us start with this nodule. I'm crossing my fingers. Uh, will the video work well it's working that's a nice one okay so always uh, ask yourself about the shape of a nodule the parallel or not orientation then i advise you to analyze the margins are they regular or irregular are they uh, easy to identify um i Maybe I can put it a second time. <laughs> of course, it won't be working a second time. So here, these, these are the fixed images. Then you have to uh, determine if there are the echogenicity of a nodule and the presence or not of hyperechoic uh, foci or uh, macro calcifications. This is the vascularity, in case you're interested. And uh, the question of uh, one of our uh, colleagues here, the uh, elasticity is uh, 114 kilopascals, so uh, above normal uh, in any case. So uh, how do you want us to to do this, Tamas, do you want the attendees to interact? Uh, I'm yes, not sure. yes. Okay. If does want anybody comment this case? With pleasure. Echogenicity indication of FNA. Um, okay. uh, I think uh, most of the echogenities are backwall cystic artifacts. Uh, two nodules uh, adjacent to each other and because of this uh, looks microlobulated uh, 
would you say that the margins are regular or irregular? How would you uh, consider the margins? This second nodule, the right one, uh, looks like a micro level macro levelation, right okay. one. A micro levelation, I think. Here, I, I suppose, yeah. I'm looking if I can. Okay, so I, I suppose that you're uh, speaking here of macro lobulations. But no, what no, 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 the, the no. No, ma this, ma this is, is macro lobulation because of adjacent to each other. But yeah. but uh, the other one, um, the, the little bit right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is micro lobulation. This is micro, right, right size. Okay. <laughs> so on the left part of the screen, how would you describe this? Mm. Tell me. Do you see my red uh, marks or yeah, not? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah? Okay, yeah. nice. Yeah, like okay. simulation. Uh, mm. We can decide in video, maybe. <laughs> okay, so mm. these are speculations. You you see the sharp angles that are made by these. Uh, uh, you see the, the, here. There's free speculations. These are true. So, uh, although I, I totally agree with you that there are macro lobulations, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. are not uh, specific of anything, uh, here we also have speculations. And so, but with this feature, at least uh, we can classify the nodule at high risk. Now, regarding ecogenicity, I agree with you that most of the nodule is mildly hypoechoic, especially its central part here. Uh, it could be discussed what the uh, significance of this small region here and maybe also this region here are because they are at least of the same ecogenicity of the right. trap muscles here. So. If we uh, refer to the new uh, lexicon, maybe we could consider this at, as markedly hypoechoic. What would you say, Thomas, on this uh, aspect? Uh, okay, I guess that uh, the main question whether FNA is indicated uh, is unquestionable uh, due to the lobulated margins. Uh, important, uh, you can. Uh, show us, uh, Gilles, where is this low adipose tissue content of strap muscle? Here we can see in the right image, I guess, better because it is new, because we have no clue uh, to what part of a strap muscle we have to compare the echogenicity, but we have now uh, the consideration that uh, to the low adipose tissue content. Yeah, I totally agree. This is totally new. Uh, this was a very bright idea of yours, I must say. So this would be the part, I hope you agree with me, that is of low adipose content. I've put a, a mark on it. Uh, regarding the hyperechoic foci, <laughs> I don't think they are easy. That's not an easy case. But I would take into account their peripheral distribution here and I would be really defined, and I, I would rather uh, consider these uh, as microcalcifications rather than microcystic cavities because I don't see any true cystic component, and I see they are peripheral. So I, I think here I would consider it as uh, one feature, one more feature of high suspicion. Not sure I can have the. Uh, the the movie uh, start of course but uh okay gamma no no i'm not able to <laughs> to remove the stylet after i've put it on or i don't know how to do it at FNA, I totally agree with uh, Tamash because it's EU Tyrats 5, it's at high suspicion. It measures 29 millimeters. So, of course, here I think we we all agree on that. Uh, any questions from the audience while well, I'm trying to remove the stylet?
I, I guess this uh, case uh, uh, shows uh, the our problems and also the advantage uh, of the EU targets because we can uh, have a uh, debate whether these uh, echogenic foci are uh, unequivocal micro classifications or not. Uh, we can have some debate uh, about the echogenicity, uh, but uh, uh, in this case, the labulation decided uh, 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 the basic questions. So it is the main advantage of using multiple parameters uh, because uh, uh, it uh, can lead to a more homogeneous uh, judgment. Yeah, and we more than two millimeters uh, from uh, the surface of a nodule here. So the surface would be this. And here, of course, this measures more, more than two millimeters. The surface would be this. And here, the speculation goes more than two millimeters uh, far from the surface. Okay, any other comment or question on this first case? In case not, I will go to the second uh, case. Oh, nice. I, no, I can't remove the marks. So second case, let's hope there again the movie works terrible. Terrible. Uh, I can uh, share your uh, yeah. Is that would uh, be nice of you, Thomas. I'm so sorry. You know, they were working at the PowerPoint is an hour uh, ago. So I, okay. So here is new ETA cases. Yeah. Uh, is that the second one? Well, it doesn't matter yes. anyway. This was the second. I uh, play okay. once more. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. So location of a nodule is important here. Uh, shape as usual, margins and the content, ecogenicity, presence of no or not of hyperechoic foci. So the grid of interpretation is always the same and uh, also analyze the uh, capsule of the thyroid this is of importance here regarding the decision you will be taking uh wasn't there any uh, fixed images yeah maybe i i, I uh, stop my sharing and you can again okay. share okay thank you so much for your help anyway tamish These are the fixed images. Uh, it may be easier to analyze uh, the thyroid capsule. So uh, there again, the questions remain the same. Uh, will you perform, or how do you score this nodule? Will you perform or not the FNA knowing that it measures nine millimeters? And what would you suggest afterwards? depending, of course, on the result of the FNA. So any comment or willing to describe this audio from the audience? Uh, yes, can I answer? Sure, with pleasure. Go on. Uh, uh, this is a deeply hyperechogenic nodule, and I think it, this nodule has have an extra tidal extension because uh, it's bulging and abducting the capsule. And so I would perform an FNA because uh, it's smaller, but it has an extra extension. So I would perf perform an FNA for this nodule. Okay, thank you. Um, and also irregular margins. Okay, so uh, w would you call this rather a uh, minor thyroidal extension, or would you suppose that there could be gross macroscopic extra thyroidal extension? What is your point? I of think view? minor, minor extra thyroidal and extension. Okay. W would you say, uh, w how would you define 
how would you qualify the hyperechoic foci uh, that we can see uh, in the nodule here? Micro classifications. Okay. So the, does everyone, the, does anyone else want to comment uh, on the subject? I started a poll, which will be finished within seconds. Okay. Uh, yes, I can uh, see it. On the okay. On the indication for FNA. On that's the indication of FNA. Uh, I, I cannot see the results. All results apply. No, I don't see. I see. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I, I don't see these results. Okay. Yo, it's, it's your turn, Jill. Okay. okay. I guess that the video was much better to judge, uh, to make judgment on the presence of microclassifications. Yeah, uh, maybe. Because yeah. it uh, was more evident that uh, it has many. I thought there are some uh, intraparenchymal microclassifications. Uh, Right side, uh, left side of the isthmus. Here, here, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. So what, what, one would could wonder what they correspond to, and is the nodule already infiltrating uh, over mm -hmm. the other part of the thyroid mm -hmm. parenchyma? That could be possible on the pathologic basis. Uh, so yeah, I thought. Maybe. Mm, I thought uh, gross extrathyroidal extension, the you nodule know, have the gross, I thought. Yeah, we have a comment. The uh, muscles on... are emitted. Mm -hmm. We have yeah, a comment so on the possible uh, extension into the trachea uh, in the chat. Mm. Okay, very interesting too. So, regarding the extrathyroidal extension here, uh, with my pointer, I show you the normal thyroid capsule here and here. So here, the capsule is discontinuous, but moreover, uh, the impression here that the normal strap muscles are here, but here we are, we are under the impression that the nodule is invading these strap muscles because I, I can't see them anymore. What I can see is the nodule by itself. And the same thing here on that, uh, on the left, uh plane uh because here we have a strap muscles and i can't see them anymore but it's more disputable here uh but i think i would quote this as as a gross thyroidal extension or at least suspected gross thyroidal extension regarding the trachea you can see that the angle that is made between the nodule and uh the trachea is a at least uh, right perpendicular angle or even an obtuse one, uh, more than 45 degrees, that is to say, more than 90 degrees, that is to say. So here, the obtuse angle could be regarded as a possible feature of extension into the trachea. So at least it should be mentioned in the report as possible. So I think uh, that we all agree that this should be FNA'd uh, independently less than 10 millimeters or 11 millimeters. And um, I wouldn't uh, try uh, treating this with uh, radio frequency because of the probable gross thyroidal, extra thyroidal extension and close abutment to the trachea at least, which would render the treatment very difficult or impossible with safe margins. Any other questions or comments? Okay, I share your third case in video. There yeah. is a question in the chat. Oh, so uh, I'm not sure I can have access to the chat while I'm doing this. 
there is a question Gilles uh, asked yeah. if you would address uh, directly this patient to surgery jumping the mm -hmm. respiration <laughs> the other way this is a eutariats 5 is uh, for sure a cancer we may skip uh, for the aspiration uh -huh. or uh, still uh, for the aspiration is needed? You know, that's very interesting and funny because this question very uh, often comes up uh, during uh, the, the lectures and, and, and the congresses. And um, furthermore, uh, there is a very recent, very interesting paper uh, that addresses the uh, role of artificial intelligence in predicting uh, the result of fine needle aspiration and that showed that in 95 percent of cases by analyzing the ultrasound pattern with artificial intelligence the result of the cytology could be predicted which means that maybe in five or ten years we will be uh, we will won't be performing the FNA. So uh, obviously, as uh, if you often practice thyroid ultrasound, uh, you're going to predict the result of the FNA, and in that specific case, uh, you're quite sure that it is papillary thyroid carcinoma. But I think that still, for legal reasons, uh, you're going to perform it so that the surgeon uh, or yourself, or the endocrinologist, can inform the patient that this is a cancer for sure. And that will be a very uh, mandatory reason to operate on it. It's not suspicious for. Uh, we need uh, we need certainty. So yes, I would perform it all the result before. And there is another question, Gilles. Is MRI a good tool to assess extraterrestrial extension? MRI? Mm, there are there has been some reports on the. Uh, on the use of MRI uh, during the pre-operative assessment of uh, PTC. I'm not sure I have uh, an evidence-based uh, answer on the question of extra thyroidal extension. Uh, I think that I would um, use MRI not to assess the extension in the strap muscles, but rather uh, if I there is extension in the trachea or in the vessels or uh, within the uh, uh, previous vertebral fascia. And, and I think that in these indications, looking for gross extra extension or to the esophagus, Yes, I would certainly advise MRI in that cases. If I only suspect gross extra thyroidal extension in strap muscles, I think that I would only inform the surgeon uh, of it, but not specifically indicate MRI. I don't know. What would be your answer to this, uh, Cosimo? The same you provide. I completely agree with what you said. Uh... As for the strap muscle, I don't think we, we need uh, second level imaging. Uh, uh, as you said, we may talk with the surgeon and the surgeon may take uh, care in uh, removing the tarot gland uh, in trying to be larger uh, into the strap muscles. So I agree with your suggestion. Mm, okay. Another people is asking, what about the, the, the case you showed before? Do you have uh, the results of the aspiration for uh, your patients yes. and the outcome? Yes, thank you for the question. So both papillary thyroid carcinomas, case one and two. I can see the chat again. Great. Okay. Other questions? Okay, we move forward to your third case, Jill. Okay. So here is the video. Uh, 
probably once more and thereafter once more and okay and for final Okay, that's your turn, Jill. Okay, I'll see if I can share the, the fixed images and if they provide some uh, more information. Um, sorry, what I wanted to show you also with the US case number two, but with the fixed images uh, was the uh, vascular distribution here, the, vas the vessel that crosses the thyroid capsule uh, and goes to uh, into the muscle uh, could be considered also as a feature of gross extrathyroidal extension. Uh, this one to going into the, the muscle from the thyroid is suspicious. So uh, fortunately, <laughs> you showed us the movie. And these are the fixed images. So here, uh, what's interesting to analyze is the, uh, the orientation obviously so here we have a 7.5 uh thickness 7.5 millimeter thickness and a 5.6 uh length uh here you have to analyze also the margins the ecogenicity and uh the uh hyperechoic foci that we can see here. So does anyone want to comment uh, on that nodule and give his advice on the indication of FNA and on the way it could uh, it could I'd be like taken in charge? I'd like to comment on the nodule, please. Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, this nodule has various features to be considered high risks or you uh, to rats uh, five because it's taller than wide. Uh, it is uh, hypoechoic. It has micro uh, micro calcifications and uh, also it's the shape. There is a speculated shape, so I would go for FNI in this FNA for this uh, nodule. Because okay. my opinion, it contains mostly all the criteria. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, speculated margins here, a lobulation here. So, marked hypoechogenicity here, more hypoechoic than the uh, muscle here. Um, and what do you think about these hyperechoic? Uh, spots in it how do you how do you interpret this i'm not sure myself you have an opinion on that i guess they seem like uh, central ones but uh, the one posteriorly posterior it seems like it's peripheral one i i'm not sure from the from the image uh, maybe the video would be would be more clear but uh, i guess yep. there is a conglomerate of micro macro calcifications so yeah i would go for that yeah that could be an explanation uh i am under the impression that sometimes i see this and that they correspond to amyloid deposits the one yes. we can uh, see in medullary thyroid carcinomas uh, what yeah. do you think of that tamash do you have an opinion yes, yes. Absolutely agree. This uh, uh, might correspond to amyloid deposit uh, in a quite econormal pattern, and there are microclassifications or, or what uh, we should uh, name these uh, tiny spots. But this is uh, a quite a specific uh, pattern of uh, of uh, medullary cancer. Mm -hmm. So within a hypoechoic nodule, such isoechoic uh, irregularly shaped fields, uh, I'm very uh, Curious about the final diagnosis. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Professor Solmosi, does uh, amyloid deposits have uh, acoustic shadow? Not, not surely. Uh, I, I, I think that we have uh, quite a few cases to draw mm -hmm. uh, consequences, uh, and uh, there is a shortage in the literature regarding this pattern. I guess mm -hmm. that uh, it was mentioned uh, not more than three times in the literature, mm -hmm. so we have very limited uh, data. Mm -hmm. I this thought pattern uh, uh, is enough uh, to perform calcitonin measurement in my practice. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Irrespective of the cytological uh, result. Yeah, I totally agree. And what, what do you think of uh, calcitonin um, washout assessment in such nodules? I, I think that the serum calcitonin determination is much more uh, uh, exact. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I won't perform uh, washout calcitonin except for uh, tiny uh, suspicious metastatic lymph nodes in the follow-up of patients. Mm -hmm. So, so for uh, primary diagnosis, uh, I, I never used uh, uh, only only serum calcitonin. So, so finally, the diagnosis for was medullary uh, thyroid carcinoma. So I, I wanted to show this case because I think it's important when we're dealing with small EU TARAT5 nodules that we have in mind that in small percentage of cases, let's say 2%, uh, it could be medullary carcinoma. And in that case, we're not going to uh, suggest active surveillance. And we're not going very obviously to to, to suggest um, uh, radio frequency. So I think it's important to have this somewhere in mind. And especially if you have this kind of uh, hyperechoic deposits uh, in, in these nodules. Other comments from the audience or Tamas or Cosimo? In the chat, the question. they are asking, uh, in this nodule, it seems difficult to perform if I need aspiration uh, because of the location. What are your thoughts? Um, the, the, the way I perform uh, the FNA is um, that I uh, do it perpendicular to the uh, to the probe, that is to say, not the, the parallel way, but the perpendicular approach. So uh, I would approach the nodule from the its upper part. My needle would be descending, and uh, there would be absolutely no risk with the common carotid artery using this perpendicular approach with the probe in the transverse plane. Um, but uh, there would be a risk that uh, no material is removed from the nodule because it could be of a highly fibrous uh, component with not that many cells. And in that case, uh, probably maybe I would perform one pass with the usual 27 gauge needle, but I would certainly also perform one pass with the 25 gauge needle uh, to uh, have some more material and no other problem with that. But we have to be modest. The rate of a non-diagnostic sample is um, higher in sub-centimeter nodules than it is in uh, supra-centimetric nodules. That is true anyway. And Gila, there is also another question. Uh, is there any diagnosis with the parathyroid adenoma, atypical parathyroid adenoma? So, um, so that's an interesting there. question because on the transverse plane, uh, the nodule is quite posterior. And when a nodule is posterior, you should always at least intellectually raise the question of a pyrophyroid uh, origin, but pyrophyroid adenomas uh, are always smooth. Their orientation is parallel to the skin. Uh, they are 
uh, ecogenicity is variable from mildly hypoechoic to markedly hypoechoic, but there are no hypoechoic spots in the, in these. The orientation is very important, so parallel to the skin. So if this uh, would be of parathyroid origin, uh, I would fear a parathyroid carcinoma. But uh, I would not raise the possibility at first sight because on the uh, right uh, plane, it really red gland and not posterior to it. So a parathyroid carcinoma inside the thorough, inside the thyroid gland would be a rather a rare case. And Gilles, there is uh, some discussion in the chat. Uh, uh, let's say that you perform the, the calcitonin measurement. Yes. It's only slightly elevated. Yeah. There are some people saying, uh, would you perform uh, the, uh, calcit the, the calcium stimulation test? Uh, and other people is answering, uh, I will perform the calcitonin measurement on the fine respiration washout liquid. What do you do in your practice? So we have yeah, two well, positions here. In my practice, in case, let's say, the uh, calcitonin serum value is 18. <laughs> uh, so I would do a washout assessment in the thyroid nodule, and it really works very well in our practice. It, it would very probably uh, answer the question of a medullary whether it is a medullary carcinoma or not it can be difficult on the cytology uh, alone um, but uh, with the washout assessment we we solve the problem most often and the last question is uh, uh, if you have a micro calcifi macro calcification into the nodule uh, is there any risk of uh, failure of the failure respiration procedure non-diagnostic result uh, because of the macro calcifications? Yeah, yes, that's a, a very good question too, of course. So uh, it depends on the size and on the location of the macro calcification. Because of course, if you uh, your needle uh, just goes, uh, does not cross the macro calcification and you're not able to sample another part of the nodule, you, you won't get any material. So I take great, great care of uh, the portion of the nodule that uh, has no macro calcification. That's for sure. And if it is complete and round, I do not even uh, try. But the, I know the, that our Korean colleagues do it and core needle these uh, nodules with uh, macro calcifications. I mean, even the round complete one with success. So uh, I'm a great admirer of these, uh, of our colleagues, but uh, I'm not able to perform it myself. It's very difficult to, to handle classification in, even in histopathological analysis. So I guess that uh, the use of core needle biopsy has a limited role to overcome of this difficulty of gaining adequate material.